Uh, Ian Schoen is the owner of Schoen Horology and Schoen Design. Ian makes watches, but I'm not sure if he would call himself a watchmaker in the sense that we refer to it. Ian has a, a bachelor's of science degree in mechanical and manufacturing engineering from Boston University. He worked as a senior product designer and mechanical engineer with IDO from 2014 to 2017. IDO is a world famous design firm with offices everywhere from Silicon Valley to Shanghai, China. They are responsible for the design of such things as the modern computer mouse, laptop computers, and all kinds of things you use every day. In 2012, Ian started Shown Design and launched the PIN project on Kickstarter, where more than 1,700 backers helped him raise more than $65,000. This year, Ian launched Shown Horology with his first wristwatch. He is currently working on a limited series of 100 wristwatches featuring new old stock ETA-based DOXA movements with the case style and hands being made in Massachusetts. I first met Ian about three years ago at an American Field event in Brooklyn, and I was impressed by his practical approach to manufacturing and design. It was there that I received my Schoen Design pen, and I will admit that I was hesitant to put the pen in my pocket with my keys and my pocket knife. But after three years, I've become a big fan of what he called the deep pocket carry. I don't think I would ever go back to putting a pen in my shirt pocket again. Ian brings a different perspective to watchmaking and is not your typical AWCI member, which is precisely why we invited him here today to speak to us. I hope that even if you aren't thinking about launching your own watch brand, that you will still be inspired by design thinking and the ways in which Ian has tackled the challenges he has faced in his business and apply them to the way you do business as a watchmaker or clockmaker. I'd like to introduce Ian Schoen. All right, good morning. Let me get plugged in here real quick. Welcome. It's an honor to be here amongst so many watch and clock and horological enthusiasts. Uh, there's not many times in my, in my life that I get to speak to a room of people who even understand a little bit of what I do, uh, which is really great. So uh, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, before I dive in, I want to give you a quick outline of today's talk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. What do I make and how do I make it? How, do I, how did I get into the idea of making watches? How I made my first watches and a step-by-step -step breakdown of those pieces. And then I'm gonna go deep into a case manufacturing project and kind of share a lot of information and learnings that I had from manufacturing cases. And then I'm gonna zoom out and talk about my transition from a hobby of a watch, you know, my, my hobby of making watches for myself to full-time making watches for other people. And then some closing thoughts on the industry. So, like Jordan said, uh, I run a company called Schoen Horology. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's the place where I, I guess, I need to find a way to talk about what I do. Because it's not necessarily watchmaking, like Jordan said. I'm not a trained watchmaker. I have a watchmaker who works for me, who helps me time my movements and refurbish them. So. You know, I, I met with Nick Minusos a couple of years back at one of those American Field events in Brooklyn, you know, because I had a small watch on my pen table, and he said, you should call this horology and not watchmaking. And I said, okay, sure. So that was the birth of Schoen Horology. So I want to talk about what it took to take those first watches around, you know, 2012 in 3D printed plastic from this to these first machined watches, machined watch cases and dials, to these watches, my next series of watches, and then finally evolving that design to the design that I launched with in November of 2017, the Dot Cardinal and the Dot Prismatic. But before I talk about the watches, I want to talk a little bit about my background. Um, it comes from my schooling, like Jordan says, in mechanical and manufacturing engineering at Boston University. Um, I also was super into machining and thought like, how do I apply my engineering skills to make things? So 
I used to teach um, milling courses for other students at Boston University in a student-run machine shop. And I got really into the idea of helping people make things that they could carry with them all the time because it would remind them of their manufacturing training and get them excited about engineering and design. So after school, I worked at a company first called Essential Design in 2012. This is a product development firm where we would take ideas for clients from you know, a rough sketch and uh, some technical, um, let's say like, you know, a client would approach us with a challenge and say, we need a, a new preamplifier for violinists to play concert solos. So we'd sketch the idea, we'd create rough prototypes, we would test them, as Evan here is testing on the, on the screen. <laughs> um, we'd create fully documented 3D, uh, or detailed 3D CAD models, and then we would produce those final products uh, with help of 2D documentation and being liaisons to the manufacturers globally and domestically. So from Pro Audio, I also worked in scientific instruments. This was a front end of a mass spectrometer. It was a very detailed uh, technical project with more than 40 sets of parts and many different manufacturing operations. And then also home automation, uh, sci um, home automation, medical devices, consumer electronics. It was a really broad sweep of things that I got to work on in product development. And I'm very lucky because um, a lot of these projects required a deep dive in thinking about how things were made, not just how to design them, but to say, okay, if a client wants to accomplish this goal, how do we match them with the right set of manufacturing processes and the right set of skills to deliver the most value? So always quick thinking and also working with a diverse uh, team. So working with people from a design background, graphic designers, industrial designers, um, other engineers, sometimes branding people to deliver like a holistic experience from a design perspective. But outside of my day job, I also really still like to make things. So I built a home shop around 2013. Um, this is one of the first pictures I had on my phone of the home shop. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But my roommate moved out. I didn't get another one. <laughs> I bought a Hardinge, a little Hardinge cataract, and a TIG CNC mill, and a bunch of other tools, and built this shop in my apartment in Brookline. And that's where I started uh, tinkering on, on watches. So, like Jordan mentioned, also outside of my full-time job, I was working on running a pen company, which is something I stumbled into because I enjoyed making pens for myself. You know, I had a, I had a closing lathe that I bought when I was 20 years old, uh, and I kept it in my parents' garage, and I would machine metal pens. And friends and family would say, oh, I, I want one of those. And they'd say, okay, great. So I'd go back to the lathe and spend, you know, six hours and multiple failed attempts trying to make them a metal pen, because it's a difficult part. And I thought to myself, okay, uh, maybe I can't machine these, but maybe there's some people in Massachusetts who can help me machine these. So I started looking around for local machine shops, and I thought that as a student at the time, this would be a good way to practice product development and to practice design engineering and being able to take something from my shop and bring it to, um, a new, uh, and bring it to the world by utilizing local manufacturers that are already very good at making things. So I took this uh, pen design, brought it to some local manufacturers, and then nights and weekends, I would run my pen company uh, called Shown Design. And like Jordan said, I ran a Kickstarter campaign, which was very successful. And um, the new challenge was not in making the pen, but also marketing it and sales and entrepreneurship and all the other pieces of a business that I had no clue what I was doing. So this was a nice platform to experiment with those things. And it also, you know, outside of my day job, put a little extra money in the bank account, which allowed me to spend on watches and, you know, buy my first nice watches and then also buy watch tools because I was interested in making watch parts. So that was nice. Um, so after um, working in product development for five years, I decided to take a step back and focus on watches and my pen company. So in 2017, around April, I quit my job and I moved into a bigger space in Alston, Massachusetts. And this is a little video of my workshop in Alston, Mass. Let's see if it loads. Thank you. 
quite the whirlwind of information. So I want to share my watches again and start talking about what I do here, right? So um, this is a completed watch, of course, right? Not in process. Uh, and these are all the parts that I make on this watch. And I want to walk through each part individually and share the process. So um, on this photo, actually note that I don't make my screws from scratch. These are screws that I buy, that I modify, and these are cold-headed screws. They're very strong due to the cold-heading process. Stronger than, uh, stronger than screws that I can machine, actually. So I decided to modify cold-headed screws for this project for my case back. Um, the cases are made out of uh, 6AL4V titanium or 316L stainless steel, depending on what the customer requests, and they're machined from solid stock. The dials in this configuration are a stainless steel dial with etched numerals that are then subsequently machined out uh, from the backside for the running indicator. And the running indicator is that small window that you see around six o'clock there. And it's a running seconds disc. It's essentially a disc that sits where the second hand sits. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, and there's the disc here. The disc is made out of titanium, so it's non-magnetic, which is really nice because it's really far down the gear train. Uh, these are some hands, also made of stainless steel, uh, and I'll walk you through the process of how I make those. And then a movement ring in aluminum. So it's quite a bit of work making all these parts, um, but uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll show you exactly how I do that uh, later on in the talk. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the running indicator first, because it's one of those things that's not, um, it's not as common in, in conventional watchmaking. Uh, so this is, the, this is the seconds disc. And there it is on my Derbyshire lathe with a lever action tailstock, drilling the 0.2 millimeter center hole with a carbide bit. Uh, first I etch these parts and then I drill the hole, test them for trueness on a movement that has the escapement removed so I can spin the wheel very fast and watch if the wheel is running true. And if it's running true, I'll pass it through to the next manufacturing step, which could be painting or anodizing the dots and the lines in the running indicator which are two main graphic elements that I have in my watch. So it helps tie the whole design together. Here's a quick video of it running. I apologize, it's from my phone, but phones are really nice because it allowed me to have all this content for this talk today. And that, that sound, that's actually the movement running. It sounds, like, uh, sounds like techno. Anyways, um, so I thought this was a great, uh, this was a, a great little technical challenge. Oops. Let's go back, sorry. A nice little technical challenge that added on top of the case making and dial making and hand making that I was already doing. But the real reason I went after this running indicator is because it allowed me to position seconds lower on the watch. You know, when you get a movement, 
it has the seconds position set in stone unless you want to remake that movement or find another movement, and that wasn't the case. It's not what I wanted to do. I had movements that I wanted to use, but the seconds were really high up. So by making it a disc and opening the aperture at the bottom, it allowed me to have no aesthetic compromises, which was really nice as a designer because I'm super picky and kind of a jerk. So <laughs> this, this is a ton of work, but it was totally worth it. And also, you know, to have these graphic elements in different colors popping up from time to time on the watch was like a nice little something. I don't know, it was a nice little detail. And, and note, you can't really track seconds with the running indicator. I mean, I guess you could, but uh, one of the main things I heard from watch collectors um, that I was like engaging with through different collector groups in, in Boston, because I was at the time collecting watches as well as trying to make them, is that there is an anxiety with some watches of people tracking seconds and being like, how accurate is my watch on a day-to-day -day basis? And always checking it against their phone constantly. So this was a nice way to remove some of that anxiety because it's very difficult to track the seconds. <laughs> it's super accurate, trust me. <laughs> and this is a shot of the movement that I use in my watches. It is a caliber 900 based ETA, like 900 series. And these, there's kind of like a murky story as there are with some things in watch history here, but someone came into possession of 200 of these movements at some point in time through some liquidation of some service center, possibly in the US. It's complicated. I bought them through someone who had them and was, wanted to get rid of them and I was like, perfect, because they were sitting collecting dust for nearly 50 years. These were manufactured around 1960s and I took one to my watchmaker we completely overhauled it and it ran quite good. So we said, okay, this is perfect. It's 10 and a half lines, it's quite thin. And I said, this is a great movement to make a 37 millimeter watch out of. You know? And um, also it was, it was very difficult to break in at the time and get contacts in Switzerland to buy movements. So this was a nice way to sidestep that conversation and allow me to have freedom to have 200 movements, 100 of which would go into watches and a hundred of which would be ready for service or parts or whatever I needed along the way. So it was, you know, it was a nice compromise. So I'm going to do a deep dive into cases later, but this is my current case manufacturing process. This is a Mori Seiki NT2450, a common watchmaking tool. No, just kidding. Um, it's a, it's a six-axis live milling turning center. So you have on the left side spindle one. It's like a lathe. And on the second side of the picture, you see the, right, um, the red little piece up there in the top right corner. That's a milling head, and it can hold 240 different tools. So that's how I use, uh, that's how I cut the sides of my lugs, using a woodruff cutter ground to the purpose. Um, and then on the other side of the machine, which you can't see, there's another spindle where you can grab the work from the backside and do subsequent machining processes. So this is a very complex manufacturing piece of equipment. And I did not start here making cases, but this is where I did end up. And I'll walk you through how I did get there in a, in a moment. The cases are finished by hand. Um, and I spent a lot of time finishing cases because, you know, manufacturing, even with a CNC machine, you don't get perfect geometry out at the end, you know, you get rough tool paths at times and you need to bring these to a, a customer level, right? So I spend a lot of time developing different fixtures and different processes to add the specific textures that I like to the sides of these watches, to the underside of the watches, in between the lugs, what have you. Uh, and please come find me at some point during the convention. I want to show you this work. It's kind of hard to document over uh, the slideshow, so just have a look at it and we can discuss the different finishes together. This was a customer watch I just finished for someone in Japan. Um, and the reason I brought this watch up, excuse me, is to note the sharp lug corners, like uh, in here. Now, a lot of the finishing process that I've been trying to absorb around watch finishing was in case refinishing. And there wasn't a lot of information around how do you finish a watch when you're manufacturing it for the first time? How do you create those textures that you're trying to protect when you refurbish a watch? So I had to come up with ways to get these super crisp textures and a lot of it, um, you know, I started with buffing and using different wheels and, you know, watching videos about caser finishing and it, 
it didn't, it didn't really get me there. So I had to actually take those cases that were machined in you know, a really nice CNC machining center and then put them back on my hard inch and remachine them exactly the way I liked to get the textures and finishes super crisp. So that was an interesting learning experience. Even if you're manufacturing at a high end, you're gonna have to be remanufacturing in your own shop. This is a photograph I took a number of months ago for a photo shoot, so it's very staged, I apologize, but uh, it's of some of the tools I use in hand making. Um, now, as you know, you can make hands so many different ways in the watch industry, depending on the geometry that you're trying to create and the finishes that you're trying to create. Complex finishes, or sorry, complex geometries and low cost would lead you towards a stamping operation, while one-off, um, very thick hands might lead you towards wire EDM or machining. I've tried a number of different processes, and right now I'm, st I'm set on a hybrid between etching and a lot of handwork. Because essentially what I discovered over the years, making hands different ways, you know, in batches of, <clears throat> let's say, 20 to 50 hands at once, is that I spent a lot of time on every single surface refinishing them to create the aesthetic that I wanted. So I said, okay, it doesn't really matter what we go into the, the hand making fight with, it's what we come out of the fight with, right? So etching was a really nice way to get bulk geometry really fast and a couple of the different shapes that I wanted and then subsequently taking those hands and stoning the edges of them in a couple different fixtures to achieve flat geometry on the sides and then putting them on a glass plate and achieving flat geometry on the top. One fixture that's kind of a sleeper in this last picture is this one here. I apologize, I don't have a better picture of it. But that bronze plate is actually what we'd call in manufacturing a soft jaw. So essentially you can take a soft jaw and you would machine the profile of your part in the jaw or in the, in the, in the brass. And it would allow you to hold your part at different angles and orientations. So I can take my hands and clamp them in a small vise using this soft jaw and flatten those surfaces uh, effectively, you know, um, in, a, in a faster amount of time than it was when I was holding the hands in a wood peg, which was my process before, because it's something I had seen in a video somewhere and I didn't really know how to do it. So by borrowing techniques from modern manufacturing, like soft jaws, I was able to actually create process that was effective for making hands in my own studio. The hands also have to be um, drilled and reamed and I was finding this was uh, very difficult because I use full hard stainless steel because it polishes better. Um, and I was, you know, I have a couple sensitive drills and a couple different setups. But what I found I was lacking in the manufacturing process was the feel of how the drill bits were doing, how the reamers were doing, the life of the tools because it was so unpredictable with these parts. So I got down to making some hand drilling fixtures and this was a critical piece of my hand making process because by being able to drill those by hand, you can really tell how well the cutters are holding up. So these are essentially staking tools, I guess you could call them, or like it's almost like a sights tool. But instead of the springs, I put these 3D printed spacers here because I found that the springs would get in the way of actually feeling the force on the hand. Um, and they're ER8 collets. So these collets are super accurate and they're relatively inexpensive and you can get them anywhere. And I found a frustration in that I had a sights tool and I would have loved to have used a sights tool to you know, do the manual drilling of these hands but I couldn't find the drills, the, uh, the cutters because they were tapered cutters, they were wacky, they weren't exactly the sizes I needed. So I said, okay, I'm just gonna build this setup, use ER8 collets and then modern carbide tools and modern reamers that are made from a local manufacturer in Massachusetts that are exactly to the size that I need them. So each station has, um, three positions, one for a carbide drill, and then two for reaming, and then they have a hole at the base of the fixture, and that allows me to index the work, which is the hands set in another fixture, exactly on true position, and then the upper portion is pinned in place so you can get dead on accuracy, which is really nice. Um, and another thing to reflect on is, you know, making watches is part of the fun for me, but making tools is also super interesting and super fun and challenging. Um, and I really like this process as much as I like making the watches themselves. And sometimes I think uh, sharing this process reminds me of why I like doing this so much. Making tools is as much fun as it is to make a watch. 
So uh, to talk about dials for a moment, you saw the two styles of dials I presented the watch earlier. One was a cardinal with a painted numeral and a steel dial, and one was the prismatic with a colorful dial. The prismatic dials are created using titanium and a process called anodizing. So I have an electrolytic anodizer in my shop which runs a current through a bath, like an electrolyte bath, and it allows us to oxidize the titanium in-house. And that oxide on the titanium is clear. So I'm no scientist and I do a really Mickey Mouse way of explaining this, but essentially you get um, a wavelength disturbance when the light hits the oxidized titanium that's almost as if you're looking through a prism, right? Light goes into the prism, it bends, and it comes out a different color. So with titanium, it's a natural process where you can achieve a super vibrant color using a, a, the oxide finish. So I use titanium oxides or anodized titanium to achieve my prismatic dials, and then I use enamel paints to fill in the spots for my stainless steel dials. All right. So now that I've told you um, the basic layout of the parts that I make, um, I want to talk to you about why I do this. So to me, watches are an amazing mix of design, engineering, fashion, aesthetics, science, and manufacturing. And horology, you know, by definition, is the intersection of these things. And like you, I care about watches as a functional piece of art. Um, but it's... I don't know, it's for me like creating work that I know is permanent and I know will like go into the world and hopefully be taken care of by future generations of watchmakers is a very powerful thing. You know, I can look past making something for a customer right now because I know this thing is gonna travel on and hopefully exist for let's say a hundred years because as you know, everything within this watch is repairable by conventional, uh, conventional watchmaking knowledge or watchmaking expertise. Um, for many years to come. And these parts are widely available for this movement. They made so many 900 series Ettas, it was silly. And you know everything else is relatively easy to repair uh, over time. So I, I kind of think of it as a long game as I'm making one watch and not just of that customer, just to try and uh, you know, take my time. And you know, it's like thinking about the future importance of these pieces rather than the importance of them t right now today. So. I'm gonna take a complete left and talk about how I got here, which is kind of like a ridiculous story, but bear with me. Um, I found my way into watches through bicycles, right? And this is me racing my bike. Um, actually, I think this was maybe like three years ago, but uh, when I was 17, um, I got really into the idea of um, racing bikes, and I was working at a bike shop at the time, repairing bicycles. And there was this subgenre of bike culture around handmade bicycles, and I didn't know about it at the time. But it was, uh, but it like really piqued my interest. But there were people building bicycle frames by hand for customers, and there were these beautiful works of art. This bicycle is made by a friend of mine, Chris Bishop, in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I grew up. And Chris is like a master craftsman. He works in multiple different types of steels and creates filleted lugs, and um, he works with um, stainless steel, and it's just, it's, it's phenomenal work. It's really incredible. Um, and there's a, a, a large contingent of these bicycle frame builders globally, and especially in the US, there's like kind of a, a, a small industry of these builders. And they take materials like aluminum and carbon fiber as well, but a, a lot of the people work in steel, which I think is very peculiar, but it, it starts to reveal an interesting depth to this bicycle frame building. Um, oops, let's see here. So um, I was inspired by the depth and the pure craft scene in this process. And when I was 19, I started trying my hand at it. I bought an oxyacetylene torch and some brazing rod and some tube tubing, and I got to work. Uh, this is me in my parents' garage at 19, brazing up some some practice tubes. Note, I'm wearing a Nuka watch. It was one of my first uh, weird watch purchases at the time. It displays time in a very odd way digitally, and because it's a digital watch, they don't really have to pay attention to the conventions of displaying time. So I thought it was very fascinating. So at an early age, I was into these weird watches. Um, 
So the process of building a handmade bike is you, build, you have to build a fixture first, right? So I took some 80-20 and I machined some parts to hold the tubes while brazing. And I built this complex fixture and it was like, it was a, an undertaking to even build the fixture at that time because I wasn't quite a good machinist. I could turn parts, I could make, uh, you know, I could mill a hole or whatever, you know, but it wasn't, I wasn't quite ready. So I, I just, I pushed as hard as I could and I built this fixture, uh, which enabled me to hold the tubes while I brazed them up. And um, there was a lot of handwork involved in this. Like you'd have to take a tube and cap it with another piece of steel and then file it to fit. And it was this combination of aesthetics and engineering and design and build. Um, and it, it was just like this amazing combination that would lead you towards a final product that was really exquisite and beautiful. So this is actually the second frame that I built, or the, the third frame that I built. It was a stainless steel cycle cross bike. Um, and I raced it all over New England. Um, and it was just, I don't know, this process of like going really deep into a build and teaching yourself how to do something um, was, I don't know, it, it was really empowering for me. And it kind of set the stage for all of my projects later in life. And I was glad that there was a cottage industry of you know, small frame builders to look up to and say, wow, these people are in their garages or in their shops building things by hand that are incredible and if you work hard you can do this it was like very you could like see a straight line to the finish which is kind of a beautiful thing in craft because oftentimes you know let's say you pick up a watch and you see it it's not a straight line to the finish it seems like a, a little bit of a, a crazy road how could you even imagine to make these parts but th with the frame building you could you could almost see it and understand it uh, pretty quickly as to how you can get to the finish line so I completed this frame, um, and I, I, I think I completed my first frame in 2009, and I built one every single summer that I was home in Baltimore. And the reason that I bring up this whole frame building thing again is uh, it created the mental model for me around craft and how craftspeople can um, create something by sharing information that allows uh, them to bring a higher value to a customer. But it's not every customer that wants this type of product. Like if you were to go dollar for dollar with this handmade carbon and titanium bike, you could get a great specialized or Cannondale or Trek for a little bit lower money that might be a little bit lighter or what have you. But there was an appreciation for the craft in this subgenre of bicycles that was inspiring to me. Because people, they wanted it because it was made by other people in a certain way, right? And not just because of what the end product was. And to me, that got my head scratching because it's something you can't really, you know, you can't really explain that to some. Like, let's say if someone walks into a bike store and they know how much money they want to spend, you can't convince them to go in this direction if they're set on buying a production bicycle. And the other way goes as well. If someone wants to buy a custom bicycle, it's very hard to convince them to buy a bicycle that's bought, made in a store or made from a bigger brand. So there's like this intangible piece here where peop certain people value craft deeply and it allows you to make a life out of making something very interesting. So with this analog, I thought of, you know, I, I was getting really into watches, maybe I was 22 around this time. I thought of the frame as the case of a watch. Because the case of the watch has so much emotion and so much design and so much engineering. It's a feat. It's a real feat. But I could kind of see my way as to how I was going to machine these parts. Um, and it was really exciting. So this was around the time when I built that home shop in my house and bought that Hardinge and bought that Tag mill um, because I knew I wanted to make watch cases in the same way that I was making these bicycle frames for myself because I saw the analog and I didn't quite see it in the industry, right? Because there isn't a ton of people making just watch cases uh, besides watch case companies, right? There aren't individuals making watch cases. It's a very, very small number. And I was like, why is it that cycling can have this really rich community of handmade builders when we don't have this as much in the watch community? And I guess we do have it with the AHCI and like the super high-end independents who are making like everything, right? Um, but maybe there's, a, maybe there's a, a small medium in between that that I, I wanted to explore. So I'm going to start to go deep into a couple watch builds that I did at the time and how I got started in this and then try and share the tools. Um, this is going to be a lot of information so feel free to you know, write, write down some questions we can discuss it at the end. Um, this was one of my first watches that I ever built. 
I bought a watch on eBay, a mechanical watch in the top left corner, and um, I took it apart, reverse engineered it, and built a little 3D CAD model around an aesthetic that I wanted to create with a four o'clock crown, kind of funky, just a number four on the dial. You know, I like to have fun with these things. So 3D printed that case after reverse engineering the movement, went to Vitaig and machined the dial, which meant I had to, you know, build it in CAD, write tool paths in CAM or computer-aided machining software to program the mill exactly the way I wanted it to create the parts. And then I sharpied the hands, of course, and threw it into the case. Because <laughs> that's what you do. Um, and after this watch, I started to reveal through the process of just doing it and just tearing apart this watch what the unknowns were. Hey, what's this part? I didn't account for this part. Or, oh, my stem is not in the correct position. How come I can't just put my crown wherever I want to? I need to start thinking about that in terms of which movement I start to pick and the dial height, and all these variables started to stack together. And I started to understand the bigger picture. So I created a more complex architecture this time. Uh, that's seen here on the left with a nice little exploded view rendering. And this architecture would allow for the machining of a case, because I was also thinking about manufacturability in this pass, and not just making a watch with 3D printing. I wanted to really think about, OK, how am I going to take this case and flip it and hold it in different ways to get the geometry I wanted? So I thought about manufacturing, and then I thought about design for assembly. Um, and again, I wasn't, you know, I'm not a watchmaker, and I didn't have guidance at this time, but around this time I, was, I, was, I started to meet with uh, Nicholas Tradius, my watchmaker in Boston, um, and I wish I had asked him for insight sooner, because I definitely made some mistakes in this architecture that could have been avoided, but we'll get to that later. Um, but this architecture at least allowed me to solve for some of the problems that I found in that first build. So I 3D printed those parts as well, just to do a test build on this, on this watch before I embarked on the machining journey for the case. And I used a Form Labs SLA printer, which was really nice, because uh, I had it at work, which was great. And then I machined a hybrid movement ring dial, which was a really terrible idea, but it, it sounded really good at the time. So I machined that part, popped it in there, and created this watch which was nice because now I had something on my wrist that, I, that was kind of interesting visually and people started to ask me questions about it and I had to come up with the answers, which was important because I didn't know what I didn't know at this time and you know, it allowed me, like the process of building these watches attracted other people that would start to give me the insights that I needed to grow. So um, I took that same, I took that same architecture and this was around 2004. 15 at the time, because I'd, you know, I'd spent some time on these watches, and this is again nights and weekends outside of my day job. And I started turning my first watch case. So I chucked up a big piece of stock in the hard inch and created this profile you see here. Now when I designed the watch, I wanted to create geometry in the watch case that I knew I could manufacture. I didn't want to create a design that would end up in a portfolio somewhere on the internet. I wanted to create a design that I could make. So all the curves of my watch were based on geometry I know I could turn, and I knew I could mill that geometry. So I put those two things together and created an aesthetic that was very manufacturable. So here's me turning the case, and then I mounted that case onto the mill in a very crude way with some tape and a screw, and I started going after the outer profile. Right? This is not rocket science at this point. Um, it is very difficult, but it is not rocket science. Um, so after like, a couple months plugging away at this case and programming each individual tool path one by one because I didn't, I didn't know how to write a super complex um, CNC G code to program multiple tools and set all the tool offsets. I was very basic at this time and I was still learning. Uh, I created the, the first set of geometry on the left which is all top down, right? All the milling is from above and from the turning. And then I flipped the part in the mill and started to drill out the areas for the screws mill out the recesses for the O-rings, um, and, and complete the first side, second side of this watch case. So this is that watch, um, again, with a built-in movement ring dial hybrid at first. I, I don't know why. It's somehow I thought it was like so clever when I made that design. It was so difficult to get the movement in there and get it out. Um, but I digress. Uh, 
I ended up making a brass dial just with a flat machine surface uh, and using that afterwards because I was having so much trouble. But at this time I was still using quartz movements. And the reason I went after quartz was because there were so many unknowns around mechanical timepieces and I didn't have any mentors in the watch community yet. You know, I was just starting to meet with Nick. And um, you know, it was just easy to, to get going, to get started with that quartz movement that I bought on like AutoFry for like maybe $6 at the time. It was very budget constrained. Um, the, next, the next piece of this watch before I got to the, um, the, this, this finished piece that you see here on the right was figuring out how to machine out the crowns and drill the lug holes and drill out the area for the case tube. Um, and this proved quite complicated so I came up with a little brass fixture mounted on a service plate, got the part parallel, and put it into a share line manual mill uh, because this enabled me to have a little bit more control while I did this and guess and check. And I was able to complete this watch. But it illuminated that I was going to need to build a lot of fixtures and develop more process uh, if I wanted to build watches, right? Especially at scale. Because this was kind of ragtag at this point. There was no real work holding. I was checking the parts every single time I, I wanted to run a new operation. So I started designing new fixtures for holding the case for the final machining operations for the crown and for the lug holes. Uh, but at the same time, I also wanted to continue iterating and testing different uh, ways to make the first steps of the watch case. So I started machining them from plate and trying a couple different things. This one's a titanium watch I machined from plate. Um, and none of it really proved like a good process during, uh, during my tests. But um, something was illuminated very quickly, and that was that I was burning through tools, cutting tools, like mad, because I didn't have coolant on this machine. And this thing was just eating tools, especially machining titanium dry. If you've ever tried to machine it, it's a great way to start a fire in your apartment. It's a great way to make your upstairs neighbors very angry. Uh, it's, it's, just a, it's, it's just a bear, for real. Um, so so I, I thought about that challenge. Um, which I'll get back to soon. I came up with a new way to, to start the process, which I'll show in the, in the next couple slides. But um, I had this idea around work holding for the crown machining and for drilling out the blind lug holes because I'm a sadist and I wanted blind lug holes for my first watches and not through holes, which would have been infinitely easier. Um, so I 3D printed a fixture to machine these watch cases because Machining a fixture takes time. You know, it, that could take you a couple weeks if it's a really complex fixture. And with this fixture, I was like, it had angled slots to hit the different angles for the, the lugs. And I was like, man, this is, this is, this is going to suck. So I just 3D printed it. And I'd read something in a manufacturing magazine about modern manufacturers actually 3D printing their fixtures to gain efficiency in the workplace. And I was like, wow, I wonder if like, some Joe could do this as well on like a cheap MakerBot and, and turns out you can. You can 3D print fixtures for one to two to five parts and it's rigid enough to get the, get the feel of manufacturing with that fixture and then you can go ahead and manufacture hard tools. So 3D printing this fixture allowed me to test this concept and iterate before investing $1,000 into that fixture build which I was going to have to sub out because my mill was not capable of cutting this fixture. It was just way too massive. I'll show you a couple shots of this fixture running. Um, there it is, obviously, machining out the uh, recess for the crown. And then over here, drilling out the lug holes for those spring bars. And you would rotate the case, you know, 180 degrees, and then you'd use this, uh, the secondary slot, I think, uh, on the other side over here. Yeah, that's how I did it. And that would give you your second set of lug holes and you go over to the other side. Oops. So this watch was completed um, and it looked pretty good. I just you know, threw a, 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 brass, a brass dial in there but I kind of scotch brighted it up because I didn't, I was designing as I went and I didn't really think about the dial too much at this point. I just wanted to make a thing and then I'd go back and try and refine the design. But I did create uh, dot markers on the inside of the case because when I was manufacturing this case, I wasn't thinking about buying lots of tiny little end mills and machining numerals and all that stuff. It, was, it seemed like a little bit too far of a challenge. I said, I'll machine dots, which is funny because if you look at early watches um, from a lot of the independent makers, there are dots around the outside of the, of the case because it's a very manufacturable design. Like early Jorns have dots on the outside. 
And it, it resonated with me that this was a geometry that people who make watches put into their watches. Like if you're a modern brand, you wouldn't necessarily start with putting dots on the outside of your case because it, it doesn't, it's, it's got a specific look to it. It doesn't look super refined. Um, but it was very true to the manufacturing process. So I was designing aesthetics that were very manufacturable at the time. Anyways, I thought it was interesting to point out here because those are features that actually lived on to my final watches and are very part of my brand DNA right now. I machined the case back in a couple operations. Uh, it's relatively, uh, it's a simpler part than the case, it's a flat part. Um, but the big process change that I wanted to talk to you about and the juncture I got to was, okay, my neighbors were getting upset, I was burning through tooling, um, and I needed to save time because these watch cases were taking many months to manufacture and I couldn't, I couldn't, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't a business and uh, I wasn't thinking about it from a business perspective wholly at this point, but people kept asking me, how much is this going to cost? And I didn't really have a good answer because it was like, you know, I was ruining watch cases left and right and there was really no way of, of figuring out how much this was going to cost and making them out of steel was so much harder than making them out of aluminum and the tooling getting burnt up was half my inexperience uh, and half the material and lack of coolant. But um, I came up with a new approach which was actually inspired by some of Rolex's manufacturing capabilities for their cases. And Rolex would stamp their, their case blank, which would give you superior material properties because you're compressing the grain structure of the material. And I said, wow, that's really nice that they have that stamp blank because it saves them time because they're not cutting from a solid block, which isn't necessarily why they did it, but it inspired this idea, which was um, a near net manufacturing process. So near net is used when you would uh, essentially take out, like take a forging or a casting and take away a lot of the machining time because the machining time is expensive. So for me, it wasn't the, the time that was expensive, it was the tooling and the noise um, and the ability just to work a little bit faster and to be a little bit less precious with each of these pieces as I went. So I water jet out this blank that you see here by offsetting the geometry of my case profile by about a millimeter radially. So by water jetting these parts with a local vendor for, you know, I, I think it, it was, I think I must have paid like 500 bucks for like 50 blanks. It allowed me to save time on those first initial stages and start to experiment with a new manufacturing process that might actually be commercializable in the future and might be a decent workflow. So I would take this blank, I would machine the back of it in the mill, and I'm going to show you a video of that, and I'd mount that in the lathe to get this profile geometry, which was an interrupted cut at this point in the lathe, which I was scared about, uh, rightfully so, it is very difficult. And then I would mount that back into the mill and do subsequent machining steps. So I developed a whole new fixture set at the time based on these learnings and I'd essentially load in the water jet blank into the fixture, clamp it down with a rudimentary set of clamps that I developed. Again, not the best jig and fixture design, but hey, it was happening. It was done. <laughs> um, and then the first operation would go and I would machine out the backside of the case. And the backside of the case, I think, was five tools. One end mill to do the center, one end mill for the O-rings, a drill for the 080 screws in the back, and then another end mill for some reason that I can't remember. You can now understand why my upstairs neighbors were becoming a little bit upset with me in my Brookline apartment in Boston. Uh, so once the first steps were done, again, I'd mount that part in the lathe um, using an expanding mandrel, which was a fixture I picked up from a company called Mighty Bite. Essentially, it's just an expanding mandrel like you'd find um, in like a 5C collet or something like that if you get a mandrel collet. Um, so these were really great. It enabled me to hold the parts on the lathe really rigidly and do that interrupted cut and get that curve that I wanted and machine in the bezel. And the bezel was a part of the case in, during this architecture. And then I'd take the, the watch case, mount it in the mill, and start machining out the subsequent processes for crystal seat um, and the face of that dot ring was machined in this step. And then mind you that the outer geometry looks very rough here and that's because it's still the water jet profile. So what I did was, 
you know, having that offset, I would then come in with a really nice cutter and very slowly and precisely machine the outer contours of this case to produce a really good finish that would then take a little bit less time to hand polish to bring to like the kind of quality you'd see in actual wrist watches. Lovely. And then this is the next rev of that 3D printed fixture with a full hard anodized aluminum setup. So it was like a really nice uh, scratch proof fixture. And um, I don't know, it was just, it was like the next rev. It was finally becoming a bit faster. Now I could kind of take parts from that water jet blank and run them through the three stages on this fixture and the one stage on the lathe and get a manufactured case at the end that resembled a watch. And that wasn't, you know, I wasn't scared to ruin a part and learn because it was less precious. It wasn't investing so much time in it because I had the process now. So this really accelerated my learning. And then I'll show this, uh, this sketchy little setup here. It barely clears, but it cleared, so clearance is clearance, as they say. All right, so once that was drilled out, this was my first batch of 20 cases. Uh, you can imagine it's a crazy amount of work, um, but with that process, it was moving a little bit quicker, and I was able to identify areas where I was faltering and start to solve for those things and ask for help. Because now that I had a process in place and I had tools running in the mill, I could ask other machinists, say, hey, where am I messing this up? You know, should I be using coded tools? Should I not be using coded tools? How are my feeds and speeds? Um, you know, it, it, it enabled me to have a conversation piece so that people would take me seriously and start to impart knowledge upon me that would help me get to the next step. So these are the first four watches in that series that I created. Uh, the left was that first brass dialed watch with a mechanical movement. Um, side note for a second, I actually did redesign this case in between that quartz watch and the subsequent machine pieces for a Puso 7000 series movement. Uh, I'd come across, or I guess Pizu, it depends how you pronounce it. I'm kind of in a vacuum here. Um, but to me, it's Puso. And uh, I bought 10 of these because I found them on eBay in new old stock condition for a relatively affordable price. Um, and my watchmaker agreed to service them up and bring them to, to running quality. So I was like, great, I'll use those Pizu movements for the first 10 pieces. Um, and I made a blue titanium dial. And this was when I started to also experiment with etching. This was my first etched stainless steel dial. And then um, the first prototype of a prismatic dial with a radial fade. And note, this case is also machined in stainless steel. So I replicated that water jet blank process in stainless and started to run stainless parts in my apartment. Uh, which was, if you can imagine, even louder and even more time consuming and tooling intensive without coolant. And knowing what I do now about machining, that was such a bad idea. I could have had a fire. I could have had two fires. Um, so now that I had completed watches, I started to show them around to friends in the watch industry and the collector circles that I started to uh, frequent. And I picked up a little bit of media. This was around, I think, what's the date on there? 2017, May. So I started conversations with Warren and Wound a little bit earlier than that. Um, and this is actually around the time uh, where I was getting ready to make that leap and leave my full-time career to pursue a path in watchmaking. Um, it may seem like a big leap hearing this story, but at the time, you know, you're working in consulting, you're working on multiple projects, I'm hungering to get back to the shop and work on these watches, my pen company is doing well, I was a busy guy. So I really needed the extra time. Um, and taking a step back from my career allowed me to put the energy into this hobby that I really wanted to and see if I could make watches in a different way in America. Uh, and I don't know, it was, uh, it was worth a shot and I would have never been able to live with myself not having d dove into this uh, heads first, you know, looking back on it if I didn't quit my job at the time. So I took a leave from IDO um, and haven't gone back. It's been 18 or so months full time. Um, and Warren and Wound, they brought me onto a podcast around, around this time because I brought prototypes to show them and I said, hey, sure, check this out. And they were blown away by the process. So I did a podcast with them a while ago. It's really interesting, in my opinion. Talks about uh, American manufacturing in a different way, uh, which I thought was 
it's kind of cool. So uh, listen to it if you're interested in hearing me jammer on about some uh, American manufacturing. Um, so this was like a pretty crazy junction because I had the process for machining the cases. I also had process for, mach for making my first set of hands. These are handmade hands here as well. And, and the dial, I had you know, a hybridized process between a local etching vendor who was helping me with the etching of stainless parts and then an in-house machining process. So I had kind of this group of processes that could produce almost everything besides the crown and the screws and the crystal and not the movement, of course, at this time. Um, and it was, it, was, it was getting to the point where it was like gelling. And I was like, okay, can I, can I sell these? So I started showing them around. Um, and uh, I think it was maybe Nick Manusos of Horological Society of New York that said, oh, you gotta fix your lug corners. You can't have these like big uh, swooping radii there. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's a, that's a nice design change. And then I went to someone else and they said, oh yeah, wouldn't it be cool if you could just tweak this one piece here? I said, okay, yeah, yeah. So I, I had a lot of things on my plate that were suggestions from people within the craft and within the enthusiast space. And I also had a bunch of things I wanted to change in my own design. So I went through a, a full redesign at this point, which is really painful because that meant that that fixture was now obsolete. That meant that the, those water jet blanks were no longer applicable and all this process I had built was out the window. Um, but it was an important step because in this, you can't get so caught on to something that you built as like your darling because it might be the wrong path. You know, those watches, those four watches and those 20 cases were a learning opportunity and were a foot in the door to get me started. Um, so I took that box I closed it, and it's very painful for me, and I put those watches into a drawer, uh, and I did not finish them. It was really, it was really hard. I like, I, I'm still like, ah, uh, it, it like kills me, because I put so much energy into them, nights and weekends. But I redesigned the case. I bumped it up a millimeter to 37, uh, sharpened the lug corners, made them a little bit longer. I spaced out the dots a little bit more, so it was a little bit more aesthetic, because these are things I was noticing didn't look quite right in the machined parts as opposed to the computer parts because they look different in real life. And I was also thinking about seconds at the time. So this is when I was like, st like struggling with the idea of putting the second, the, the second hand exactly where it was positioned on this watch, which maybe I could have done with a long sweep second, but it just it didn't feel right. So this is around the time that I came up with the running indicator as well and started, ending, uh, and started developing process to, to fix that. So at this juncture, I looked at what I had done, and I looked at the new design, and I decided, okay, it was cool that I made watches in my apartment, like in-house, as they say, um, which I don't think is what they meant, but it's fine. Um, but I needed to take this seriously, because now I'd quit my job, and I wanted to really make watches in America, and I want to make great watches. So uh, I asked for help. I went to a local, machining, uh, a local machine shop that I had worked with for a number of years in product development. Um, I had sent tons of models to them for trade shows, really complex stuff, so I knew they could handle the geometry that I was going to throw at them. And I gave them the new files and the 2D documentation that I had created with tolerances on it to you know, make sure that they could check these parts and make sure they're in tolerance, because that's super important. And I machined my first batch of cases out of house with a local vendor. But uh, maybe a better term would be outhouse because these parts came back and they looked like garbage. Um, or to me, they look like garbage. Because when, when someone else spends time on these types of parts, they're not they don't have the eye, they don't know what they're looking for. So there was a lot of um, idiosyncrasies in the machining and like weird steps in the parts and you know, crud in the corners. And it, it required an incredible amount of cleanup to take these watches from what you see here um, to something that I was ready to present at a trade show at the time. So I sprinted through, essentially. This was like a, a great catalyzing moment. You know, I had these machine parts, and I needed to come up with a way to fix them, like, and make them look really good. Not just make them look like hacks and, like, watch-type objects. Like, these needed to be, like, sellable, awesome watches. So um, I had signed up for the Worn and Wound trade show, which is a small watch blog, um, and, you know, they were doing this wind-up show in New York City. I said, okay, I'll drop the money and sign up for the show to put a goalpost in mind to like set the timer. Uh, and having this timer set and promising people that I was gonna be there with watches was a nice catalyst to like really get it into gear and make sure that okay, no matter what, 
I'm showing up to the show because I paid a lot of money for it, <laughs> and I'm going to show up with watches. So um, in between, let's see. Uh, so in between when I got these cases and that trade show, I had a lot of problems to solve. So I spent a lot of energy. Um, thankfully, I was you know full time on, on this project, and I put my pen company aside for a moment and had someone help me run it, and developed all the finishing techniques for taking these cases from start to finish. Brought them to the trade show. From that trade show, I was able to um, you know get the respect from some collectors who were like, "Wow, this is a really unique piece. Uh, these are these are looking really developed." Why don't you come to the local red bar and show off these watches? So it started to open new doors for me to show these watches to people who might buy them. And it was around this time, this was like November 2017, um, that I started to get my first couple orders. People saw those pieces and were like, this is good enough. These are real watches. These look like, um, these look like actual time pieces. Um, and this was one of the first commissions I made for a customer. Um, with a blue purple dial because he loves the color purple, or sorry, with a purple dial, purple anodized dial because he loves the color purple. And it really started to set the gears in motion. You know, I was selling watches. Um, and, you know, by no means are these watches cheap. This watch is $5,200. Uh, it definitely comes with a price tag to have that handmade and craft aspect. Um, but the people who saw this watch, it was starting to resonate with them. So watches that were out in the field or out with people started to generate new conversations and it got the ball really rolling for me. And another place that um, when we talk about this craft ethos and this like people who appreciate that type of handmade bike or just understand without me having to describe what I do, they see the process, they see the product, they know kind of like where I'm at. They, they like get me one to one. And another place is that this happens a lot is in Japan. You know, there's a big uh, craft, em craft emphasis culturally there. So I started to sell my pens and my watches in Japan at the time. This was, I think, probably started around the same time of that wind-up show because I had been having conversations with someone in Japan. And so now I have a number of stores in Japan that sell the pens and uh, I got profiled in a local watch or uh, in a power watch magazine in Japan which enabled me to again take this to the next level and get more eyes on my work. So, now with a little bit of the PR out of the way and people starting to understand who I was and what I was making and seeing how it's different, uh, I started to have to figure out, okay, a watch that takes 100 hours isn't necessarily a viable business model, so I need to start to learn ways to make the process more efficient without sacrificing quality. Um, and that meant better machines, right? So taking that case manufacturing process and putting it onto that multi-axis lathe enabled me to get cleaner geometry than you were seeing in those milled parts, right? Even outsourcing. So that saved me a little bit of time. And then uh, this was a, a lapping fixture that I recently built for dials, which allows me to take the outer surface of my cardinal dials and get them to a very flat, very beautiful finish in like eight hours but it's, you know, it's operating off on its own, so I don't have to be polishing the tops of these dials anymore. Now I can focus on adding the texture. So now I'm getting into this new space where I'm figuring out the economies of scale and trying to figure out how I can take my production from 10 pieces per year and bring that to maybe 20 pieces per year for the next two years. And then something I wanted to talk about briefly uh, before I open it up for a Q&A is a new fascination of mine um, and I haven't shared this at all, not even on Instagram, so, you know, stays in this room for the most part. Uh, this is a module I'm working on. Um, and I got really into the idea of when we think about horology and we think about why watches and the art and the science piece, specifically of watchmaking and the mechanicals, mechanical engineering behind it, like, you know, the running indicator was the first step, creating a new visual on my watches that was unique. What about a jump hour? What about something that would be kind of visually interesting and that tells a mechanical story, a story of like building a mechanism. So this is a product that I'm about 25 hours into right now and I have a couple crude prototypes and it essentially is, uh, oh, this is a really tiny video, making it big. It's a micro jump. I wanted to see if I could build it in a one inch um, diameter, like the same, same size as my current watch. And it essentially is like just this little jump indicator that hits from one hour to the next. 
Uh, there are a number of flaws and mistakes in this design, as you can imagine, for my first pass at making a module to produce uh, jumping hours. Wait for it. So nice. But it was nice to see it. It was nice to see it click, right? So that's like, that was a decent accomplishment for me. But again, like a different, a different visual, a different uh, methodology and way to think about creating modules, in my opinion. It more is based on the philosophy of a company called Oxen Junior, but I really, uh, I really admire. They do a lot of dial side, dial side complications, so stuff that actually sits like almost nested inside of the dial, and that module just like drop, like drops right on top of the movement and allows you to you know accomplish something like a retrograde or a, a perpetual counter or what have you. So they've done a lot of really cool work in that space. I want to be thinking cleverly about how I build this module to create a new visual on my next watch. So that being said, this being a collaborative space, I'm open to suggestions if you have any watches that I should go purchase and take apart, or that I should go purchase and take apart and then return. Um, just kidding. <laughs> if you have any books that I should read about building uh, complications, I'm open to it, because this is where I want to head. You know, this is the next step. And I'm using the sales of my current watches to fund the research and development and you know, all the necessary things I'm gonna need to build for this next phase of work. So zooming out a little bit, um, my hope with my work and with sharing my process here and through Instagram, you know, which is a, a huge platform for sharing uh, anything these days, I guess, uh, is that I want to help inspire and connect the dots between people who want to build this craft space in the U.S. and globally, right? And I know there's a lot of people doing this, but it's a little bit of a, it feels like a little bit of a closed community and a community where you have to like jump through certain hoops to get there and there's like barriers. So I want to try and break down the barriers a little bit and share with anyone who's willing to listen, okay, here's a, here's a case making process. If you want to make your first watch and the case is a really important part of it, here's that process, right? Here are several processes to make hands. Go for it. Like, you know, it's not, uh, this, as much as I spent time and money developing these processes, they don't belong to me. They, I, I believe they belong to the community. So how do we create a watchmaking space of these types of craftspeople that we see in that handmade bicycling space? Like there's definitely an intermediary between like Kari Vutalainen and like the micro brand, right? There has to be that middle ground and I feel like it's a very, I don't know, it's, it's a good time for it. And you see good evidence in this with like other watch companies such as like, you got like a Weiss watch company, you've got the Vero guys, they're making cases and dials. Like there, there's, there's good companies in the US that are putting energy into making parts and developing this craft space. And I think it can be uh, a bigger craft movement in the watch space in the coming years, or at least I'm hoping that it can be. Uh, and also kudos to uh, AWCI for developing the American Times piece, piece page which allows people to find these makers of watches and have dialogues with them and purchase their watches and help them get to that next step. So I wanted to thank you guys uh, for having me talk here today. I hope this wasn't too boring um, and I appreciate you, uh, you uh, hearing me speak. So yeah, if you have any questions. Then, yeah.